Denise, uh, as you start your introduction, I'm going to uh, share Rothy's timeline. Um, and I know you'll be introducing both Rothy and Iklok, so people will have to hear extra well as you are uh, introducing Iklok, since we won't have his timeline up. Uh, but uh, I wanted to say that Denise is a freshman, uh, thrilled to have her introducing our keynote speaker and our moderator today. Um, as you can maybe tell from Denise's background, she is amazingly at UC Berkeley. Uh, we're happy to hear that. And just something interesting about her, she is expanding her horizons, not only by introducing a speaker, um, but also because she's taking Hungarian, which I thought was pretty unusual. Denise, I'll let you take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Victoria. So hello, everyone. I hope everyone is having a good day so far. Like Victoria said, my name is Denise Robles, and I am currently a freshman majoring in bioengineering. I wanted to introduce Rathi Murthy because I find her to be very motivational for women who not only persevere a career in STEM, but also in the business world. With that said, I am glad to be able to introduce great contributors to the technical and business world. Today, we have the pleasure of having Rathi Murthy as the keynote speaker and Dr. Eklok Sidhu as the moderator. Rathi Murthy has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's in computer engineering. Wow. Murthy is currently the chief technology officer at Verizon Media. Murthy has an outstanding record of achievements from being called a stellar technology technology leader and being named one of the country's top women CTOs in 2017 to representing big companies like Gap, American Express, and eBay. Dr. Eklok Sidhu is currently the faculty director and chief scientist at the Berkeley Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. Sidhu not only published the book Innovation Engineering, but also created the popular Data X course at Berkeley. Additionally, Dr. Sidhu holds 75 patents in internet communication technologies. With that being said, it is my pleasure to present Dr. Sidhu and Rathi Murthy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Denise. Um, and, and thanks everybody. And probably most importantly for at least today's purpose, thank you Rathi for joining us. You know, this is the Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. So where would we be without distinguished innovators? Um, we, we need that component. And, you know, I'm just thinking about the purpose of today. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think uh, you've had, obviously, an, an amazing career and, um, and, you know, and an interesting career path through a lot of different things uh, you're a technology leader. Um, one thing that I think you know today should provide, hopefully, is a window into not only the path, but I, I think the path is fascinating by itself, but a bit of a path into uh, how you thought about the decisions and what were those decisions long when you made it. Uh, maybe another thing to think about were you know, for students, ultimately, you know, this is a way to translate into uh, advice that everyone can learn from, uh, definitely all the students, but just in general, um, you know, what, what qualifies as a big break? Uh, what did you, you know, what happened at different times where, where you had some insight to say, well, everyone's doing this, but I think I should do that, right? All those things that we know, um, lead to innovation and and last you know before i basically start asking my questions um you know just to set all this up uh you know a lot one of the things that we talk about a lot in the center and at berkeley in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation is the mindset and the behavior that people have to have that it's not only about being smart or you know i mean it's definitely a requirement but beyond that the the way that you look at the world in terms of behaviors the way that you you know everything from the way that you greet people or talk to people or whatever those are all things that lead to success so you know anything that that bridges all of these things together i think we'd love to get you know your your window into all of this and um and so i think what i'll do is i'm going to basically just let you start a little bit with 
maybe the college era, you know, so the way I see your career, and I'm, I'm going to probably leave some big chunks out, but there's kind of a college phase, there's maybe some early jobs, there's like the big company, the small company, and then kind of like the mix of companies, you know, like different things that don't seem like straight line jumps, you know, one to another. And, and then now, you know, at Verizon back to big and definitely, you know, in that space, what's happening in telecom, what, where, where do you see the future, things like that. So I think, you know, there's that whole path. Let's just go all the way back to college. Um, tell, you know, um, what we know is that you did your electrical engineering in India. You came here at Santa Clara, you did a degree um, and, you know, further continuation uh, of your education. What was your collective college experience like? What did you learn from it? Just tell us like how it started in the, you know, the beginning of the career. Sure, sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. And for all those great kind words, I'm privileged. I've always looked up to Berkeley, to, you know, not just as an educational institution, but you're really paving the path for all of us technologists with uh, new ideas, new innovation, new technology trends. So thank you, Clark. And your background is actually makes me kind of nervous to be at the <laughs> same table with you. So thank you. It's a it's my privilege, first of all. Um, yes, when you talk about you know going all the way back, I did do my electrical engineering in Bangalore. That's where I grew up. I uh, did my undergrad there. And in those days, few things that come to mind is I was one of five girls in a class of hundreds. So it wasn't really common to have women pick engineering as a major. So I was, uh, we were kind of like a very small group of women and it took courage to step in that field. We also had fixed paths that our parents and elders kind of perceived this is what you do. And I was going astray already at a young age. Um, but I had a huge support system, especially from my grandfather, who was a role model for me. He was one of the first psychiatrists in Bangalore. He was also the president of the Psychiatric uh, Society for India, and he built the first nursing home in Bangalore. So he had already set the path of no need to have this herd mentality. You can pave the cow path, you can be the first. You don't need to stick to any of the norms and go be what you want to be. He had five daughters, so we were also very inspired that, you know, women can do anything. So I, I had a great support system in my family that supported my desire to do something very different. So that's how it started. I went and did my engineering. I found myself, I found my voice. I grew up fairly independent. I was not afraid to you know, test out different waters there. I struggled a bit because, because there were so few in, women in the class, we had to do mechanical engineering. For example, the first two years was general engineering. So you had to go and, you know, you had to, they used to call it the smithy workshop where you had to go and work with tools and fire and drilling, which was not easy for us to do. It didn't support women coming in there. But I learned to be brave, learned to be courageous. Of course, you learn the curriculum and you, you get the basics and the foundation. But beyond that, I think I learned to stand on my own and find my voice in that system. Okay, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. No, keep going. No. Uh, all Thank right, you. so, okay. So I'm, I'm just gonna like dig in just a little bit to your answer. So this is kind of, this is what I, I heard from, from that, which is um, one, um, you, you had a role model, you know, that let you know right from the beginning, it was okay, I'm gonna say to be different or, or to do things differently, um, you know, it, like, you just didn't have to follow others. And then you've got a parallel conversation going on about, well, you're one of the few girls, women, you know, so forth in, um, uh, you know, in engineering at the time. Um, how much, how aware were you of 
the I'm one of the few, I mean, obviously you're aware that you're one of the few girls. That's not, it's not hard to be aware of it, but how much was that driving in terms of the idea of I'm taking a different path versus just I'm taking a different path? Like, you know, was it engineering is something I want to do and I, I just know I can do whatever I want to do? Um, or was there a most girls don't go in at least at that time you know was it was yeah. it like other women that i know aren't doing it but i can't like how how much awareness was that aspect in it, your like it's okay to be different so it wasn't about oh i'm going to pick the path when not too many girls are there it was more on i was doing really well in math and science in general i was getting a hundred percent and i was like i knew I was good at math and science and I wanted to yeah. pursue something there. And, and this just happened to be one of those paths. I hadn't thought way beyond that, but I'm like, hmm, I like math, I like science. There's either medicine or engineering in those years, that's what we had as option. I was scared yeah. of needles and blood. And I said, so that's gone, this is it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. So it was really, that's what I'm good at. And then everything else doesn't matter. You're just going to pursue it. That's kind of what, what, what's driving you there. Okay. So um, uh, I, I got a couple directions that I could go with this. Um, at some point, I'm just going to precede this. At some point, I'm going to start to get you to tell advice that you would give yourself, you know, give people at this age, but just hold that thought for a minute. And uh, in, instead, let's just go to your first, tell me something about your early jobs. Um, what were they like? What was your experience with them like? Um, just, uh, I, wanna, I wanna get a sense of what it felt like in that first part. So I, I guess, you know, the, the slide is up now. So that could be Informix, that could be, um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I suppose that could be Sun, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the first ones, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I breezed through a few, the first three of them, actually, they have a, somewhat of a theme in it. So I was hired out of school at Informix. There was, as usual, a lot of the campus interviewing going on, and I participated in those. And I knew I was looking at that time as a young graduate, I was looking for three key things. I wanted to find a company that was doing something different and innovative. I really wanted to do something that was different. And I wanted to work for someone who I could learn from. Someone during the interview that I found a connection with, <clears throat> or I okay. felt like I want to be like that person. And the third was I wanted a place that was fun and a good culture and I can relate and enjoy. Those were literally the three criteria I was going in with. And I joined Informix because they were one at that in those days, they were the first discussing object oriented databases. That was a new thing beyond relational databases that had just come out and I wanted to understand more and participate. In fact, I had gotten Oracle, which was the leader in databases at that time, but I chose Informix because I wanted to do something different. I wanted to pave the cow path. I wanted to test out the waters. And, and I also had a really, really interesting um, uh, manager. She, she was running and quality engineering and some of the customer centricity. And I wanted a female leader who could be my mentor and help me grow and find myself. And I do think she shaped a lot of my leadership style, even today, I owe a lot to her. So I picked her, I picked the role, and I wanted to be closer to understanding the customer. So that's why tell I went me, into that field. Tell me a thing, tell me something that you remember from her leadership style that you that you retained and let, that you liked and, and you copied. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even at that, so, Actually, two things, I'll tell you two things. One, she took risks. So I was new to the company and she said, Rati, you take on and manage this tool, be the lead for this tool. I just graduated from school. And I was like, how do you think I'll be able to lead it? She said, I know you lead it. 
come to me when mm -hmm. you have problems. And I love the way she was able to assess people and take some risk and be there. And that enabled me to grow. And I do that a lot with my team as well. That's one. And the second okay. is walking the halls, like really being there, being present, walking the halls and seeing how people are doing and connecting with them on a personal basis, not just work related. Yeah, uh, okay, that's an awesome answer. So the first one goes in the category of empowering people, like just like look at them and say, oh, you can do this, right? Yes. Um, can yeah. Get out of their way almost, right? The yeah. other one is, um, I don't know if you remember at, at Hewlett Packard, it's very popular yeah. back then, that, um, that there's something called management by walking around. Exactly, yes, yes, absolutely. And that was the yeah, big yeah. time. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Open door policy, things like that. Of course, you know, um, uh, like with COVID, that management by walking around is a little tougher. <laughs> I don't know what the, the virtual equivalent of it is. Believe Maybe it or not, I still, I've been doing the similar, trying to do the similar walking the halls through COVID by doing small breakfast and coffee chats with my team via meets or Zoom. <laughs> yeah. You can't quite just Zoom bomb meetings, yeah. you know, <laughs> drop in and say, hey, how's it going? <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe that's a future feature for managers. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where Zoom goes with that. Okay, so, um, uh, all right. I, all right, so I, I see kind of this, like that empowering idea and, you know, and the good connectivity and things like that. Um, and this sounds like a learning for you that, that you were able to build on. Let's try that advice question. Um, and and you, can, you can answer it again later on in, in, in the hour. But for now, what advice would you give yourself, aka everybody else who's watching? I would say three things. If I were to give myself advice back when I was younger, giving myself advice today is a little different. I would do many other things. I would give myself advice to take rest. But you know, in the, I would say, if I have learned and I could go back in time, I would say, be confident. I yeah. always struggled with someone else having more confidence in me than I had in myself. Just like the example I gave you, she had confidence mm. in me and I, 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 I was able to shine, but I would say, be confident, come out more confident take risk. Um, in my career, I did a lot what I call a jungle gym approach. I've tried out many verticals, many roles, many fields. And I think uh, I learned a lot. There was, it was scary. There were many times that I, at Metrio, for example, I was one of the first engineers who joined Metrio. And I was asked to do everything from engineering to networking, from to drawing cables and setting up the building. I didn't know 60% of my job and I just jumped in. I was nervous as hell, but I think that paid off tremendously. The, the spike I got in my career just because I learned so much horizontally was phenomenal. So I'd say be courageous, be confident, take risks and yeah, be yourself. Oh. Yeah, uh, so, okay, uh, um, great area, great space to take the conversation. Um, a lot of that has to do with basically having that wide comfort zone, you know, not, you know, not holding back, well, I don't know, this might happen, that might happen, that yeah. whole idea of jumping in, feel it come. Can you actually, um, and this is another one of those things that is not on the question list. In fact, I don't know if any of the questions we're gonna ask is on the question list. So your PR people might come after me later. But anyway, um, tell me about your personality. It could, can you describe it? Like, get, give me an example of like, or not an example, but like, how do you describe your personality? And, and then I'm gonna basically try to see if I can figure out like, uh, like what of those characteristics like we're helping and not helping. Sure. I'll tell you what people tell me about my personality. Okay. I think very personable, very authentic, mm -hmm. and I've been called calm in a storm. And uh, I would say fearless. 
Yeah, yeah. It, so you were like, if I put those two answers together, you're not overtly confident externally. You're right. You say you let other people draw that out of you, but you've got this kind of solid, like, like we're going to be able to handle it. That, that kind of calm. Um, what was your other, what was the other part of that answer? Fearless. Help me out. Fearless, Fearless. Yeah. Right. And that goes with your comfort. Um, it definitely goes with your ability to stretch, you, you know, in, in, into new things. Actually, okay. Clark, I would say it. I would say a little different. I I have grown into this personality um, yeah. over the years, and I I would I owe a few things to a few mentors in my life. Like I said, I drew that confidence through those mentors. Those mentors invested in me. Like I said you can do this, you can do that. And so I, as I stumbled in through their confidence, I slowly built my confidence, you know? So I think what I would love all the students to know is we grow, you can grow. I didn't come with these skills. I learned many of these skills and now it's become me. Um, that, that's a perfect message. And, you know, one thing like in, in a way I, I wanted to ask you this question, because I think there are people uh, who have those characteristics sitting in the audience or you know wherever they are, you know, virtually around the world. Um, and you know, some people are shy, and yeah. some people are, you know, and, and some people are they worry about something, and some people are um, more fearless or whatever. There's these characteristics, and it's not that all are good or bad, but you know. On, on one hand, if, if a person can say, yeah, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit like that. You're telling them, well, whatever you don't have, yeah. you can get it, yeah. right? And, um, and and it sounds like the way that you got it was by watching other people who, who you respected. You, that's absolutely right. And the other thing that, so some of the leaders I respected, and I, I've been trying to be that kind of a leader to my people, is they provided me that safety net. I believe in you, go do this. And if you fall, I'm there for you. And I think being that or finding those people in your life who can be that for you really helps you pick up those new skills and learn and shine. Yeah, I, I, thank you. That, that, that's that's a, a great point. Um, so let, let's switch a little bit of a gear uh, because uh, the you know the next big block on on that timeline is going to Sun Microsystems. Yes. And um, yeah, there it is. And in fact, I can almost put my next two questions together because it's it's on the chart there. So you know, one, let's talk about what it means to go to Sun because at that time, Sun is a really big deal. Um, yep. You know, I don't know that the audience fully understands that um, in terms of. You know, I'll just put it this way. How old was everybody at the time when, you know, at, at this time, <laughs> Sun was a big deal. But, you know, some of us happen to be around and we know that, you know, that's like going to Google or that's like going, that was, you know, really where like everything was going on. So tell us about that. And then this thing about going to WebMD, which yeah. basically in that year, nobody ever heard of. And yeah. like, so maybe you can contrast those two a little bit. Sure. So I was very attracted that when I went to, I actually joined JavaSoft at Sun and uh, Java was just starting and I was so fascinated. I wanted to be working closely with James Gosling. So when they reached out to me, I literally had the office next to James Gosling and I was like, this is sufficient for me. That's all. <laughs> I was looking for, I really wanted to be part of that new wave as they were coming up with Java. It was a very different methodology at that time that they were the first company that were launching releases out to the public to test. I, today we call it open source. Today, a lot of people do that. But in those days, that was an entirely new way of innovating dynamically, if you will. So I wanted to be part of that wave. I was part of the JDK 1.0. And that's why I joined. But you may need to tell everyone who James Gosling is. He's the father of Java. 
There you go. All right, thank you. And you're really talking about two things. One is what's going on with Java, and the other is the process of how they're innovating, you know, what, what they're doing there, right? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit more specifically. How did you know at that time Java was, was a big deal at all, right? I mean, at any time, there's like 100 new platforms and things that are always being developed. Is it because you were thinking these people are so smart and whatever they're doing is going to be great? Or was it because you could just tell there was something about the logic of what's happening at Java? How do you weigh that? I did not know how far Java was going to go. I wanted to work with really smart people. I wanted to be part of a new invention and a wave. I wanted to learn the process of how do you take something and scale it and make it big and see the adoption and drive the adoption. That's what I wanted to be part of. I didn't know how far it was going to go or where it was going to stay, but I was very, um, I had a lot of hope just because it was designed for flexibility and its platform independence and the ability yeah. to do so much more. It was doing all of the memory allocation. It was taking away so much of the pain of C and C++, which was the trend in those days that I, I knew there was something in it. There was a whole layer of abstraction that could be big. Yeah, I, I, I can agree with you on the pain of, uh, of C and C++. I have no, no issue with that. Um, what, did you, what did you precisely work on within the Java world, all the stuff that was going on there? I worked on uh, building out the first Java compatibility kit. OK. All right. Um, that, is that so that you would know whether whatever you're writing would work in a Java virtual machine? I'm trying to recollect actually. So I, at that time oh, there, was this, there was this uh, lawsuit between Microsoft and Sun because their, uh, the Internet Explorer was downloading some cookies that would you know, pretend to be Java compilers. So we had to do a compatibility kit to make sure that it was uh, truly Java or not and reject that. So it was one of those. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. It, it's a uh, you know important feature or characteristic of the whole Java system. I, I think this is after the time you left Sun. But do you remember when they used to advertise with the dot in dot com? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you asked me about WebMD. So yeah. again, it was a pretty similar thing. It was just it was I think in the late nineties, closer to. Yeah, late 90s where um, it, IPOs and new stuff was still, it was a big wave and I wanted to be part of this whole startup culture. Um, mm -hmm. There was this company called Healthion, which ha had started and they were trying to disrupt the whole healthcare system, really bring terminals into physician's offices, have patient records, on, the, on systems versus big giant books and files in doctor's offices. It was a real way of disrupting healthcare. Um, yeah. so that was very exciting for me. It was really felt like that can be the next big wave. That's what I joined. I joined there to lead um, the benefits, the health benefits portal, I think, and then the patients portal. So we started yeah. there. It's a develop, you were developing the, the portal, Correct. right? Is that Correct. what you're saying? And yes, yeah, exactly. And and then WebMD bought Healthy on after we went IPO. That was the journey. Got it. Got it. So what happened? You know, what was there a day at Sun where you said, "This has been great, but <laughs> this is not this is not what I want to do anymore." Like, what what happened between hey, Java? I, I want to be part of it and I think I'm going to go work on this web portal. I was there, and we did a we did a bunch of launches. We did a bunch of releases, but uh, you know, actually, at that time, again, I was young, and a whole bunch of recruiters were re, you know calling us uh, frantically to come because JavaSoft engineers were very sought after in the industry, <laughs> and they were ah uh, yeah to join yeah right once you had developed it, then you knew it, and so. 
than everyone who had an application. So, you know, you were probably and getting- I was quote, just tempted, I would say. It wasn't very strategic, but I was very tempted. <laughs> well, that's another strategy. <laughs> It's a the different power kind of, of youth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow the money, right? That, that's a different strategy. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I, I think in all of this, um, okay, I'm going to hold that question for a minute. Why don't, why don't you talk about this, um, the more recent, uh, like you can talk about it in a clump, but, you know, Amex, Gap, um, I, I think, uh, it, you know, Yahoo, eBay also, but, you know, what, what I kind of feel is you've got a block of consumer oriented activities yeah. here. Um, and so <clears throat> from health to, you know, retail and so forth, uh, what, what's the story? I, I think that's really the question. So I'll tell you a little, little personal story for a little bit, and then I'll get into the big clump is, um, is so I had my uh, kids actually while I was doing my master's. And so I did a lot of my education with two young kids. And I went through all my journey of startups, et cetera. And as the kids were uh, going into high school, I realized that I really wanted to be there at home to pick them up from uh, school, there was no daycare, except after school daycare. So I wanted to be there to pick up my kids early and have more structure and flexibilities. I was really working around the clock at Metrio for a while. I, I owned everything in engineering and I realized I didn't have much gap for myself. So that's when I decided I, I want to take, go to a larger company where there's more structure. So I joined Yahoo actually as a principal engineer. I started, I moved out from leadership positions. I used to lead all of uh, engineering and infrastructure at Metrio and then took an individual contributor just so I could get flexibility. So that was my, the reason I moved to a large company more for balance, my life balance. However, while I, when I joined Yahoo, um, again, Yahoo was doing super well. At that time, I lasted in an individual contributor role for maybe three or four months. And I was very quickly pulled to lead a large team. They're like, mm, no, you've got to go lead this team. So I started, I actually uh, started a team in Yahoo Media, funny enough, have come back a whole circle. Um, and I found my passion at Yahoo. Long story short, I was moved to a couple teams and I was pulled to many teams to just help them get faster and better. So it was about launching pro products quicker to market and improving quality. That seemed to be my strength at Yahoo. So I was pulled from team to team where there was problems. And I realized that I really loved doing that. I loved that transformation. That was very appealing. You take a problem statement, you know what's not working, come up with a strategy to make it better. So I made that a little bit of my brand. I started to call myself a transformational leader, helping mm -hmm. products get faster, cheaper, better. That became a mantra that I just kept repeating. That's what took me to eBay. So my my leader at Yahoo moved to eBay and he said, Rati, guess what? eBay marketplace needs to get faster and better. They're having issues launching their products across marketplace. They're only able to launch it once every six months. Maybe you need to come here and change the system. And so that's why I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's larger scale than what I was doing. And I went there to learn the entire eBay marketplace and help them get faster and better. Um, three, four years later, and I actually completed the transformation at eBay. We were actually launching every week by the time I left and things were good. I realized that I get bored once it's status quo. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and, and my, again, the same leader, Neil Sample, he moved to American Express and he said, now it's not just a an opportunity to transform engineering and technology to get 
faster, cheaper, and better. There is that, but there's also an opportunity to transform the business. American Express was moving from catering to the rich white uh, male, 60 year old, if you will, to being very inclusive and catering to the underbanked and underserved population. There's about 70 million people in the, just in the US who can't afford the banking system. So it was an opportunity to build the digital payments platform that can put banking in the hands of all these people and really transform their lives. And that's, that was very inspiring. I'm like, I can take transformation to the next level where you leverage technology to transform the business and make mm. that not just a seamless efficiency play, which was the faster, cheaper, better, but also a very transformative play to drive growth in the business. So that's where I went there. And, and after that, I did, uh, that was a stint of four years where anyway, the kids were all out of the house. So my husband and I moved to the East Coast and I used to spend one week in Florida on the beach and one week in Manhattan and kept doing that shift and was traveling a lot. I love traveling, and, but that was a lot of travel. Then the kids told me it's time to come back to the valley. You're going crazy that you need to come back. <laughs> so I said, okay, I will come back. And I, um, I wanted to try again a whole different vertical. And retail industry was going through a huge, it still is going through a huge transformation in terms of omni-channel. People were discovering how to connect offline shopping to online shopping, whether it is how do you connect the whole supply chain, retail, stores, online, mobile, and connect that experience. And, and really technology is the hero in that play. When, when a dress falls off the conveyor belt, it falls off your online shopping system too, and everything is connected through technology. So that was, again, a play where I felt through technology, we can transform the business in a very in a in very large way. So I pivoted to take on all of technology and operations, managing all their six brands to really plat platformize that whole retail se sector. That was the bulk. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it, that's a, it's an amazing path journey, you know, with all the wines. Um, if I dissect it, you know, kind of like, or take it up a level, um, you've got a couple of threads that, and I'm just gonna kind of bring them out of, of the conversation. You've got one thread, which is um, kind of, how do you do these things? It seems to be a lot of like, between the leadership and the culture, that there's this, you know, you go somewhere, but what seems to be common is you wanna work with people and get them, like even with your first job, you chose it by how you were interacting with the people. and so. That there's a little bit of, you know, getting those people to talk and work together as like the secret ingredient. Um, so in a way, your your technology or or vertical agnostic. You, you just, you, yeah. So you've got that. Then you've got this other thread of conversation in there, which is work-life balance. And maybe there were times when you didn't care about it at all, and then there's times where you do. And yeah. somehow, okay, so you're like about the culture of the organization and getting everyone to do things. And then you've got, you know, like, well, let's, let's also make your own life, you know, fit properly, right? Because you don't want to just burn out and be of no use to anyone. And then, you know, you, you've got like two more things going on. You, you've got this impact for the world because some of your stories are like, look, the world needs this. I think that probably comes later because in the beginning, you may not have that much choices. You know, you're like, well, we could do this or that. But later on, you know, we're like, well, what's the ethics behind it? What, what does that do for the world, right? So, you know, I think that's like another aspect. And then you've got this whole technical magic going on, right? That, then, you know, that, that's basically like, oh, well, the technology is the power here. And like, you know, that's your, that's the logical part of what's going on. But somehow you are, fitting these things together. I, I think at the very least, I wanted to tell everybody in the audience, do you see, 
you know, do you see these different things in, in what you're saying? You can comment against that. It's not really a question per se. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good observation. At some point, our life comes together. And I think it really, Clark, it's about finding yourself and being authentic, what matters to you. And it feels like, although it feels like a complex puzzle, it isn't. It is really us as people and um, I'll, I'll comment on a few things. Transformation for me is always people, process, tools, technology. It's all, it's not one or the other. So people are very, very integral to that transformation. If you're not able to tell your story and bring them along and find their skills and put people in the right skills and empower them, it's all, all the lovely things we talked about in the beginning about really bringing them and connecting them, but then leveraging technology to really uplift and do, then bring across the right outcome. I think it's really pulling all of this together that makes something good. And I like transformation even in my personal life. I love seeing transformation in the society and transforming people. I love people in general. So it's really about being authentic, I think. I was lucky, I found my passion. You know, what, what's great about your answer is first of all, um, you're, you're conveying these behaviors, right? You're saying, okay, I've got these positive behaviors and look, they really are translating into impact, you know, by being nice to people in certain ways, by getting them to work together in certain ways. It's not just about being nice. It, it really, you know, makes the whole thing work. And, and I, I got your message that it's also process and it's also technology. Don't worry, I, I got it. Um, <laughs> right. Um, but okay. So so I I think there's yeah. Um, I, I I think I'm I'm still digesting uh, all, all your comments. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, let's see. Um, and, and so now we've kind of like, we've kind of been through like the entire career path. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the screen here. Um, tell me about, well, I think just straight out, tell me about this. <laughs> I, a uh, couple years ago, a few girlfriends and I, I think eight, eight nine of us, we embarked on this, let's climb Kilimanjaro. I think it was just said in jest, but then we had already committed. So we embarked on that journey. And again, it was really fun. I learned a lot, enjoyed a lot, and we all made it to the top. So you see that as our picture. When did you do that? Uh, two August, I think nine. 2018 August. 2018. So it was just like a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you go somewhere, just let me know because you seem to go really nice places. <laughs> I will. I will. It yeah. actually, you know, it takes you to the space of, uh, again, if I had to connect it to, our journey she taught me a lot as a leader as well. That like where the goal, everybody had told us when we started on that journey that only there's only 10% uh, success. Like everyone starts off, there's all of these issues. Not everyone makes it to the top. It's blah, blah, blah. And so be ready for that. And it's really difficult. You can never say what's going to happen. And you look at the top and you're like, crap, I'm really not sure whether I can make it to the top. It looks daunting. The goal yeah. sometimes looks daunting. But they teach you while you're climbing. The Sherpas over there, uh, they yeah. use this phrase, pole, pole, go slowly. And one foot in front of the other. That's what they're constantly telling you. And that's literally all you do. You just keep putting one foot in front of the other and soon you're on the at the top. And then that's the really of life, I find. Yeah, you know what you're also what you're saying here, like the way that you describe it, you're making a, a parallel between climbing the mountain and the leadership style, right? Exactly. Uh, right, you're saying like, 
okay, you know, sometimes it seems complicated and you just keep going forward, right? I mean, you could be talking about any project at work or you could be talking about climbing this mountain, because right? Because it really is, when I, wherever I'm hired, they're like, oh, you know what, this is not working, come in and transform. I don't know if I can transform or not. It's, it's a big task, but you're like, okay, I get the outcome, I'm going to take one step at a time, yeah. You know, um, so uh, I, I actually, I love the idea also that you characterized your leadership style. You know, you, you, you literally gave it a name, you know, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that name, maybe that, that is a category, you know, whatever, but you know, it's like you, you found your essence and you're like, that's what I am. And, yeah. and then you use it, right? Okay, and, and then, you know, that works with the climbing the mountain, it works with the projects. So let me switch now. You are, so you're at Verizon. All this time, we haven't really mentioned Verizon at all, right? And we got like three minutes left to talk because honestly, what we wanted to talk to you about was you, right? It, it's about those behaviors, that leadership style, right? Like the things that translate for everyone. But um, now, you know, at in this kind of more ending part of the conversation, um, what are these goals, challenges at Verizon? Uh, what are you What are you trying to accomplish now? Um, or alternatively, if you want to say, what's going to be like um, big in technology? Like, like what should people study right now? Because you know, you know, have some insight that that not everybody has, given all the things that you're plugged into. Sure. So Verizon Media is actually, if people have not, you know, it's a place where we have about 900 million monthly consumers coming in and trying to experience a whole bunch of things from sports and finance to stocks and news and entertainment. So it's really our premium media site where our mission is connecting people to their passions. That's our goal. So there's a lot to be done in this whole ever-changing media landscape. And actually, if you're like the expert guru here, where things to learn are things that are changing and transforming, as especially with 5G and AI and ML. When you think about connecting people to their passions, it's a lot to do about personalization and data and connected ecosystem and really driving behaviors through personal actions. So really, I think great things to study is AI, ML, and data, and learning to innovate and adapting to change because the landscape and behaviors and people today, for example, with COVID, behaviors from our consumers have, have shifted and being able to adapt to that shift very quickly is I think critical. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, I think your answer is just take our normal classes and and and, uh, and do well. <laughs> Taking <your> class classes. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're right on track. Um, well, I will say that you had amazing timing with Verizon because given that we're in the global pandemic, I can't think of a service or a product that I need more than digital connectivity sure. that, you know whether that's on my phone or whether it's internet or how we're talking right now and all the things that you're involved with so uh i th i guess great choice perfect timing <laughs> as always i don't know um i'm gonna kind of leave it at that spot and um maybe let uh victoria help moderate some questions from other people besides me thank you so much it was such a pleasure Absolutely, thank uh, you. You too, that was, sorry, now I'm looking like I'm telling a ghost story or something. That was, thoroughly, <laughs> sorry about that. That was thoroughly enjoying, uh, enjoying, enjoyable, uh, fun to hear about the journey and things that have been going on. I know we have some students um, who I think are coming on to ask questions. I should ask Rishi and Swetha. I think too, Trin is here. Too, would you mind uh, turning on your camera and asking your question? And Wei, you'll be right after too. 
Yeah, they could probably all turn on their cameras. Yep. Well, there seems to be some issues. Way, do you want to turn on your camera and ask your question? And Maya, maybe I should try. Uh, oh, there you go. Fantastic. Okay, and you're still on mute. Oh, should I should I just go? Yeah, just go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much for taking your time today to um, give us this talk. I was just wondering, you know, um, like hearing about your journey and just looking at the um, like the slide in the intro, like it really caught my attention that um, there was just you change your um, you know companies a lot. Like every, I feel like every two to five years, um, you know, switching around. Um, but then looking at when you came to Verizon Media it was from 2000 to now. So that's, you know, much, much, much longer than um, any other company. So what was so special about Verizon Media that made you stay for this long? No, actually I joined Verizon Media in January. Oh, okay. I was at Gap for four years and then I joined Verizon Media just this year. I see, okay. I must have I must have misread this slide then. Well, I, I think it's actually interesting. I am wondering what you learned from Gap that you bring over to Verizon because I'm assuming, um, Rathi, that you bring something over from each job uh, that's a little different. Yeah. So at Gap, the the of course the whole challenge was around connecting connecting the supply chain with the stores with the online with the mobile. So there was that huge journey of building a core platform and really capitalizing on data. There was that journey. I was also, we had six different brands in the Gap family, Banana Republic, Old Navy, Gap, et cetera, Athleta. Um, so the, each of these brands, when I started, used to develop brand market channel specific. It's like Old Navy in the US, mobile feature, you know, mobile is a channel, US is the market and it's a brand. So they all had brand market channel specific features that was super costly, super slow to go increment on. So my journey was to really bring all of that together. So you build once and leverage across all of the brands. So I think I learned the muscle of three things at the gap. One is telling a tech story to non-tech people is challenging. And when you're able to tell that story well, you actually have a very good strategy. Um, so uh, that was one. The second was I really learned the power of platform, uh, building a true platform. It's very hard to sell the notion of a platform to six independent brands because they have their own money and no motivation to share the money to build something. So the power of building a platform and sharing that across the board was again a huge, huge win. And the third was really listening to the customer. You have tangible customers for a retail store, hearing the voice of the customer, walking in the shoes of the customer, building what makes sense for the customer. I think that customer centricity was something that I learned. And I think all those three things are super critical at Verizon Media. We here to pivot for our customers and customer behaviors, connecting the ecosystem is very, very critical to us. And again, telling our story. That's really helpful. Um, thank you. And do thank you very much for your question. Um, Wei, um, would you like to go next? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, thank you for sharing. I, I, I want to ask that, uh, uh, did, did you make a complete uh, career plan at the point of your graduation or have a uh, co complete career plan thought about, about your future career at that point? Or you just uh, revised your career goals uh, in some critical points during your life, um, and how, how do you made it? 
Yeah, if I understand, yes. So, wait, no, I had no idea where my career was going. I had no intention of being a CTO one day, nothing at all. I only wanted to do something fun, exciting, challenging, and learn. So I always was inclined to challenging myself, doing something different, and of course, doing the best I possibly could. And I think my career started to pivot just based upon certain skills that I recognized and started to leverage more and more as I grew in my path. And again, mentors have played a really key role who helped me identify those skills. So I think it just pivoted as it went, as I realized myself. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Is it Maya? Yeah, it's Maya. Um, thanks for the talk, it was really interesting. I was curious about, um, since you're more familiar with the technical side, there's several accusations that uh, 5G is potentially harmful to pollinators and uh, bees and other insects and things like that. And I was just curious what your stance is on that. Um, I know it has yet to be completely definitively proven, but I uh, was curious about that and was curious, uh, what do you think about technology developing, uh, I guess, more fast than we can control? Yeah, that's a very good question. So no, there has not been any definitive studies that proves that 5G is, you know, bad for animals and insects yet, but I would be very curious to start seeing as they discover it's so often the case where you're a little early to market and then there's still a lot of research to be done. I'm going to pivot back to my healthy young story. So while the notion right now feels like, yeah, of course, that's a brilliant idea to transform physicians' offices with monitors where you have all patient records right there when the patient walks in. You don't need to go refer to old paper records from the past. In the past, people would have to actually collect your physical record and take it to a new doctor. I don't even know if you kids are aware of that journey. So it feels brain dead today, but you know, Health Yarn did not succeed because we could not get doctors to allow us to put a terminal in their office. Real estate was extraordinarily costly for them to afford to use up any real estate space for a computer. So we failed because technology was a little early in terms of the market and recognition and research and ROI and understanding. It's timing is everything, but it's really, really hard to make sure you got everything right. Sometimes you play with throwing something out, researching, timing, and getting all the results all at the same time. So 5G is one that has a huge potential of truly transforming the way we we do a lot of things, especially in media, the way people can view content. In today's day and world, you might have seen recently we launched Watch Together for NFL, especially in the land where none of us can go into stadiums and watch games anymore. Watching a game with four friends is, is appealing. And this is the power of using AR and 5G and low latency. So I think there's a lot yet to be discovered, but huge opportunity to transform users' experiences. That's, that's great. Uh, I am curious, are there any things in your career, Rathi, any ideas from the different companies you're working on besides the terminal, the, the issue with, with uh, uh, health MD that you thought were great ideas um, that you wish had come out but did not or on the other hand that you thought were great ideas but didn't work for one reason or another I think there's always a lot and, and innovation is one where you know one succeeds ten fail you know and I, I can think of a few that um, were great ideas, didn't work at that time, but today would work. You know, even at American Express, when we were doing the whole serve and 
under banking there was a journey of um really bringing disbursements and payments and allowing all of the companies let me take a couple steps back for people who were unbanked or underserved population saving money for example is a huge it's very difficult people would literally save money in jars because you don't have a savings account you don't have a bank so you put money in in jars and these people don't live in very safe areas or neighborhoods so often they it's stolen and so they would lose all their savings so i knew that innovating in this space where you enable people some sort of an electronic way to save their money without a bank is is huge but adoption became very difficult people were not willing to trust that system yet Smart. it takes uh, a journey for people to go to hand in hand new uh, I, mechanisms you know, and feel safe and trusted so it took a long time but now paypal for example is doing very similar things and people have been able to adopt it so while i've seen great ideas not succeed i've, I've mostly seen great ideas take a take a longer time to succeed That's interesting. Marlea, Marlea, uh Pocket has an interesting question for you. Hello. Um Hello. uh so it sounds like you had a lot of really great experiences and enjoyed a lot of different roles and I was wondering if there were any roles that you didn't enjoy or mm -hmm. if you have advice for people that may find themselves in a situation where they're in a role they do not like as um, much. That is such a great question and I hope my company is not listening to this. <laughs> I will tell you something that uh, I I um one of the things I always said this was like 5 6 years ago sometime I think it was at American Express I said I really don't like operations. I don't want to be carrying that pager 24/7 and the site comes down and i'm called and i have to manage that and like i like building products i don't want to manage the operations i'm like ah oh, i hate that and at american express my president i mean he got promoted so i took on his role which was literally all of engineering and operations and i'm like i hate operations and he said now you're going to do all of this and you're going to actually give up your engineering side of it because you don't have to do that put that under somebody else and focus all your time on operations and i'm like oh my god this is like misery i said fine i'll do that he said the minute you do that you will build empathy and compassion for this field in a way that you never did and he was really right although i will still tell you my passion is building i have now drawn a lot from operating so i build better and i understand and i feel very um empathetic for the people who are managing our site so i also enable them with tools and automation to do their job better so yeah that was a role i didn't like but i actually have adopted as a part of my growth strategy um i wanted to bring something up about you um in in dealing with people you seem incredibly loyal and uh a little bit tongue and cheek i wanted to share something in the spirit of being loyal and i was wondering if maybe you would talk about it a little bit um it seems that you are a loyal 49ers fan. I am. <laughs> and and that's not so easy lately. Uh tell us a little bit about what interests you about the 49ers and about uh, football. Oh, it's actually a very silly answer, but I'm going to give it to you. It's truth and transparency. I was a huge fan of Joe Montana. so much so that i sent my kids to the same school that joe montana's kids were going just in the hope that i would keep seeing him while i took them to the games so that's when i built my fanship if you will for 49ers and i've always stayed a very loyal fan uh so did you meet him 
Yes, a couple of times, many times actually. And it's funny, as I've grown in my career very recently, I think it was a couple years ago, Joe, he's running um, an institution that supports education, I believe, for a bunch of um, people. And so he was, he wanted to meet with me as a VC. He's like, can I have lunch with you or something? I'm like, oh my God, my life is made. Now I'm really successful. <laughs> so yes, I did. That's fantastic. Kenza um, Zahidi has a great question. Um, and I think it's a it's a good one for us to kind of round out the talk. Um, uh, Kenza is not online, I don't think. Rishi or Swetha, no. Um, Kenza, I hope you don't mind if I ask your question. I think it's great. What skills are most useful in any career and should be learned despite not being taught at college? Which skills should you learn in your career? Mm -hmm. That might not be taught in college. I would say the biggest skill is um, a growth mindset. I think that would be the simplest way to put it. Constantly know that you're learning. I always find that I'm learning and learning from you kids. The millennials have so much to offer learning from the kids, learning from people who report to me, learning from my peers, learning from people, my, my leaders, like you're constantly learning. The world is changing, everything is changing, technology is changing. If you can keep the learning mindset, I think you'll win. Kenza, you had a second half to your question. Do you wanna ask that? Sure, hello. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It's been great. Um, my second part of the question was, sorry, I lost. Um, how can students best navigate what they want to go into considering the vast field of options? So like these days there's so, so many new fields and sometimes I'll, I'm like, I wanna go into this and this. So is there any advice for that? I think Clark and all of them can advise you way better than I, but I would, I'll tell you what I did. I always believe like follow your passion, really listen to your heart. And actually there's nothing right and wrong. While there's so many choices, there's so many opportunities to pivot as well. So I don't usually get married to this. You know, it's like, I'm ready to try it. I'm going to give it a full shot. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to pivot. Okay, thank you. If uh, in terms of giving it a shot, um, even though we are only in October, hard to believe, it seems like it must be later. Um, people are thinking about like, gosh, how am I going to get an internship? What am I going to do? Um, wow. Any thoughts on how people or what they should be thinking about uh, for Verizon? Yeah, it is a very difficult time for students, and especially given where we are right now in the uh, economy, as well as the number of companies that are not really bringing students in. Uh, we are hiring, Verizon is still hiring interns. So yes, I would say just like what I said before, lots to do with 5G, lots to do with AI, ML, data. We're still taking interns. Verizon and Yahoo in general has been huge proponents of interns, in our, especially in our space of research. We benefit so much, so much from interns. So strongly recommend all of you to, you know, still, there's a lot of options. If you're in this field, you're interested, reach out to us. We're still doing great stuff. Um, what happens if I am not studying machine learning or AI or data sciences? Uh, is there still a place for me? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I just use that as an area that we're definitely constantly benefiting because students have a lot to give. There's a lot to do for us in Verizon Media. There's a lot around content. There's a lot around platforms. I build, I actually focus on platforms and security and you could be interested in security and you wanna be interning as a paranoid as we call them. There's, there's a lot to do. Go discover yourself. While the opportunities may seem limited today, there are still a lot. Um, Syed is, has joined us. I'm not sure if, if uh, there's a question. Um, 
Said Mehdi uh, or not. Um, but what I'm going to say is that I, I, I think, uh, Sayed. Sorry about that. Uh, I see that you beamed up. Good for you. Uh, Rati, thank you so much for the talk. I really appreciated it. Um, my question is, uh, as somebody who seems like they emphasize EQ way more than IQ, how do you deal with, um, you know, obstacles and people putting you down or, you know, not believing in your idea? How do you steer past that and bring your ideas into fruition? Hmm. If people uh, put me down or are not in the space to just take a deep breath in <laughs> and then believe in myself and figure out how to tell my story in a better way that actually, so you know, many times, so on a serious note, many times when people put you down, as long as you don't let your ego get in the way and you listen closely to them and listen to that one point they may have, what is the point they're making which they're not really convinced? That's very valuable because that's the piece you need to add to your story. So if you get disheartened and you shut your ears at that point, you lost the game altogether. But if you don't let your ego come in the way and you're just listening to what else do I need to say to get my point to, or they have a really valuable point. Your idea may be lacking a whole dimension that you have to go back and work on. And that's what I've found. It's usually, it's usually that's why I said I take a deep breath in. It's like, don't let your ego get in the way and actually pay very, very close attention to what else. Thank you so much. That's been, this has been fantastic. Ikak, I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to share to uh, to kind of tie this up with a lovely bow? Um, I don't know if I'm capable of doing that, but um, I will say, uh, you know, first of all, thank you. I, I think th this was um, a, a fantastic conversation. I, I think it's really helpful. Um, you know, I, I, this is maybe more of a message to students than than uh, to us directly, you know, but we're, we're talking here, which is, you know, if I listen to this whole conversation, you know, the point, and, and I'll let you respond to this, but, you know, like, you, you're welcome to say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I said at all. But, you know, um, but, it, like, I think a really helpful thing at, at the student level is, well, if you're on a team, and you're working on something, if you can be that person that gets the three other people on that team to work well together, then it's not going to be long before you can get three teams to work together. And then it's not going to be long before you can get 100 people to work together. And that if, if I had to like take distill one thing uh, that really, you know, like was central to, um, to Rathi's ability to innovate in all these places, I, I think that's, it, it's a powerful learning lesson. And um, so, you know, you don't have to wait till you're the CTO to do it, is kind of my message. Uh, I think you can do that right now and, and kind of be on your path to that. That's so beautiful, so true. Thank you, Iklak, that is so well said. Um, oh, we good. are sharing. As opposed to the, oh, you missed my point completely. So that sounds great. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you. I want to kind of give you a hand uh, on, on the part of all of us. Thank you so much. Um, it was wonderful. We share a password with everybody because, um, Rathi, we really do value feedback and, and what everybody thinks. And the, uh, the code is Murthy, M-U-R-T-H-Y, but without a capital M, all lowercase. Um, it has been an incredible evening and a real... Um, it's been a real highlight, I have to say, of the past six months. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for your you all. Stay safe. And I know you'll all do great. It's been an interesting 2020, but this was my highlight. You made me feel so much younger. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I will go ahead and keep the, um, our, our code up. And uh, if anybody has other questions, you're happy to ask. But uh, I think we're going to be kind of 
closing down because I imagine Rafi might have some other things to do. I guess I should ask you, this. what's after Kilimanjaro? I know I wanted to do EBC, it was the Everest Base Camp this year, but um, maybe when life becomes normal. Small steps. <laughs> I'll definitely stay in touch, Iklak. I'll definitely connect with you for some bigger opportunities with Verizon Media, but it's been a total pleasure. Thank you all. Uh, thank, thank you. you. That I sounds great. I wish everybody a good night. It's oh, been yeah. an absolute pleasure. Bye. I will close down for now. Have a good night, students or a good morning or a good day wherever you might be.